This is the story of American freedom. Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson embody the spirit of the frontier and the spirit of democratic liberty in the story of American freedom. We must emphasize again that from the beginning of our country's history, there has been a fundamental split, perhaps a split fundamental to democracy itself, between those who believe that liberty is best secured by limited government and low taxes, and those who believe that liberty is best secured by a strong, centralized government with the power to tax. The American Revolution was fought in the name of liberty. The Constitution is the charter of our political liberty. But the Declaration of Independence is about limited government, low taxation. The Constitution is about securing liberty under law with a strong federal government and a government that can and will tax. That split is still with us today. Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, these were for a strong national government. Thomas Jefferson was for a very limited government with low powers of taxation. The names change. In fact, they become so convoluted it's hard to use them today. Federalist was the name given to Hamilton and George Washington and John Adams. Republicans was the name given to Jefferson and those who followed him. Today we might speak of progressives as being those who are proponents of a strong government. We might call conservatives those who are in favor of a limited government. But that split is fundamental. And it is the spirit of the frontier that proclaims the democratic liberty of low taxes and, liberty, and limited government. In fact, the frontiersman really defines individual freedom, not as freedom to do what you wish as long as you harm no one else. It's freedom to do what you want to do, period. And you don't want anybody telling you what to do. That was the spirit that uh, Andrew Jackson brought into the White House in 1828. He had killed his men, share of men, in a duel. He had time and time again asserted the idea of limited government. And his belief was that the freedom of the individual American would be destroyed by big government, big money, big financial interest. He said in words that might be used in the campaign slogan today, that the goal of big business was to reduce the ordinary American to the hewer of wood and draw of water for the rich. One of his chief goals was the destruction of the National Bank. He hated the banking interest. He hated their insistence upon easy lending terms because he thought nothing was more destructive to the ordinary American than going into debt. And after a bitter fight, he achieved that. But another of his great goals was to see the annexation of Texas, continuing the, his role model, Thomas Jefferson, and his spreading of the United States all across a continent. It was a difficult business, 
difficult to carry out. But ultimately, after he was president, it would be achieved. Texas, the fairest portion of the continent. In 1821, it was under the rule of Mexico. Mexico had just won its independence from Spain in a brave struggle. And Mexico was not a small, poor little country. It was an empire. It included what we call Mexico today, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, out to California. It included Nevada and part of Colorado. It was rich in mineral resources. But it had a turbulent history. According to some count, accounts, there were nine governments of Mexico in the first 10 years of its independence, including one emperor. But its land was so fertile, its game so rich, the herd of bison passing twice a year, as Davy Crockett said, soil that will grow anything, but above all, cotton that it beckoned to American settlers. Oh, they'd already filled up places like Arkansas, Tennessee, and now they began to move into Texas. And at first, this movement, settlement by Americans, was encouraged by the Mexican government. Mexico really had very little control over Texas. There were only a few towns like San Antonio, there were vast areas inhabited only by the Comanche Indians. And thus, Mexico encouraged men like Stephen Austin to go out into the United States, impresarios, they were called. And with minstrel bands and on steamboats, they would go up and down rivers, stop at towns and say, brother, why stay here and be poor? Out there in Texas, you can have as large a farm as you want. It's there for your taking. And so these settlers began to cross into Texas. Now they were, it was demanded of them that they become Mexican citizens. Uh, but there was a good constitution, Constitution of 1824, which was liberal promising a great deal of autonomy to the various states of Mexico, uh, not really insisting that the Anglos practice the Catholic religion. And thus, more and more settlers flooded into Texas. But by 1834, the situation had changed. In one of the almost constant revolutions in Mexican history, a new leader had arisen, Generalissimo, Generalissimo Santa Ana. And he, as dictator of Mexico, was determined to establish a strong centralized government, no local autonomy, and to enforce strictly the edict that the, all Mexican citizens be Catholic. And Worst of all, that they pay taxes. Now, these settlers, many of them have, had come under a grant by which for a number of years they did not have to pay taxes. But these years had run out and now Santa Ana was going to tax them. So it was again the old question of big government and high taxes. And these Texicans, these Anglos, weren't going to have it. And they began to form committees of public safety, just as their forefathers had done during the American Revolution. Names of towns began to change to Liberty, Washington, and under the leadership of men like Stephen Austin, but also like Sam Houston, the idea began to grow of independence. Just as their forefathers had shaken off British rule, they would shake off the rule of the 
Mexicans. And so they had come to Texas, a variety of men, true men of the frontier. One of these was Sam Houston, Tennessee man, self-made, elected governor of Tennessee. He was a protege of Andrew Jackson. But then, as governor, he married a girl somewhat younger than him, and accounts differ, but either on her wedding night or a few days afterwards, she left the governor's mansion and would never return. And her father refused Sam Houston, even his desire to see the woman again. Houston's heart was broken, and he, he became an object of scurrilous slander. How many times are great men slandered? Have you ever pondered that? And thus, he just left. Left it all behind him. Went to live with the Cherokee Indians. One of their names for him was the Raven. He married a Cherokee woman. Another name for him was the Big Drunk because he was constantly going on benders. He was a deep, dark, and dangerous man, one said who knew him well. Great huge figure of a man, six foot four, 240 pounds, blonde hair, and with what the Mex Mexicans called those killer blue eyes those eyes of a frontiersman. He talked little about his childhood. The only memento he had from those days was a gold ring, which he always wore, a gift from his mother. On the inside of it was one word, honor. So honor was the most sacred thing to Sam Houston. And remember, honor is your reputation for truth. It's your reputation for integrity. It's your reputation for standing up for your friends, not slipping around in some way of getting out of a tough position, but standing up for your friends and what is true, honor. It can exist only in the society that has the dual. So honor is the key to the Iliad, and honor was the key to Sam Houston and Andrew Jackson. There were things that could be said about you that could never be wiped out by some attorney. And so, Alexander Hamilton would die on the field of honor for what he had said about Aaron Burr. Button Gwinnett, governor of Georgia during the revolution, would die on the field of honor for a, an attempt by the military governor to besmirch his bravery. So honor was what Sam Houston wore on his finger. And he came out to Texas after his time with the Cherokees, crossed on into Texas. It was never entirely clear, but to me it's certain that he was partly the agent of Andrew Jackson. The ties between them remained extremely close, and he was acting as Jackson's agent. And then there were men like William Travis, 26 years old, Buck Travis. He had been a lawyer in Alabama, married with a child. But I mean, you can't let some wife and child be a millstone around you, can you? Yes or no? So he left them there and went to Texas to find a new life. Again, tall, more slender than Houston, but once again with those killer blue eyes. 
And thus the decision was made to declare independence and then, like their forefathers, because that's exactly who they thought they were following, to win that independence on the field of battle. They had no doubt about Santa Anna, about his cruelty, but his capacity as a general, that he had a veteran army of at least 4,000 men, hardened by putting down revolutions all over Mexico. They had no doubts that Santa Ana would come and try to crush them. They knew the forces that they could mount against Santa Ana were meager. But just like the men at Lexington and at Concord, they were willing to die for liberty. Well, Santa Ana let it be known that there would be no independence for Texas. And his proclamation went out that either these rebels lay down their arms, sign a declaration of allegiance to Mexico, or they would be put to the sword and their little towns burned to the ground. Sam Houston called William Travis to him. Travis, he said, Santa Ana's marching northward at a speed more rapid than we can, could have calculated. I do not have an army. I have several thousand volunteers, militia, but they are not yet an army. I must make them into an army. And you, you must buy me time. San Antonio, there. This mission, the Alamo, you must turn it into a fortress. If Santa Ana is not held up there for a few days, he will sweep upon my flank. I must have time to train my army and draw them eastward to force Santa Ana to follow me into the heart of Texas. I'll do it. Travis, you are a stiff-necked and rigid man. Yes, I am, General. Many say so. I don't like you, Travis. But there are very few men that I would trust with the lives of my wife and child. Even fewer that I would trust with the life of Texas but you are one such man. And so, Travis, whose whole life up to this had been nothing. Travis is what? A man of destiny. Meant to meet his destiny there at the Alamo. Goes to San Antonio, begins to collect a small group of volunteers, that will ultimately number probably around 186. They come from various parts of Texas. And there they began to take a mission that has fallen into ruins, began to use the cottonwoods from which the mission takes its name, build fortifications awaiting the arrival of Santa Ana, still driving his men hard northward through bitter February weather, wearing out horses and men on the way. In the meantime, the shooting has already started at the town of Gonzales. A very fancily dressed Mexican cavalry unit rides up to this small little settlement where they have collected a cannon. And the Mexican officer gives the Orders, surrender your cannon. I will give you until daybreak to come to your decision. Otherwise, with my overwhelming forces, I will crush you. Well, when he blew reveille the next day and his men rode towards the town, they were startled to see that cannon ride out in front of them. And in the night, the ladies of Gonzales had been busy at work. They had taken a white flag 
and put upon it a canon and the words, come and take it. Ah, the spirit of the frontier, come and take it. Well, the Mexicans decided not to and rode off. But the struggle had begun. Travis kept hoping for a larger number of reinforcements. They straggled in very slowly. Then one day, just as mid-February was breaking, there came over the crest 13 men in buckskins wearing coonskin caps. Davy Crockett and his volunteers from Tennessee. Crockett, too, was a man of the frontier, known all over the country. Plays had been written about him, biographies written about him. He had served in Congress. He had been a protege of Andrew Jackson. He was famed for his exploits, hunting bears, while he could grin a bear out of a tree, fighting Indians. But as congressman, Andrew Jackson, who had got him into the position, said, you know, you're going to support me. Well, Crockett was a pretty good politician. He had won his election. He thought fair and square. He had a very well-educated opponent there for the seat in Congress. And uh, he would always ask the opponent, who would give a two-hour speech at the drop of a hat, why don't you speak first? Well, yeah, I'd like that opportunity to get to the crowd first. So after five or six speeches, every time the opponent would speak and then finish, and Crockett would get up and say, that was a long speech. I don't know about you, but I'm mighty dry. Let me go buy you a drink. Then finally, the car, his opponent said, wait a minute, you're going to speak first. So Crockett got up, gave word for word that opponent's speech, and then said, I'm worn out from that speech. Let's go get a drink. And he won. But Jackson came to him and said, you know, I want you to vote this way on the removal of the Indians. And Crockett said, I can't. I can't, General. We're breaking our word. It's not a matter of breaking our word. It's a treaty. Now, I want you to vote my way. Can't do it. You'll never hold another political office. Well, it'd break my honor. And he never held another political office. He simply wrote a letter saying, my constituents who voted him out of office had said to hell with me, my I say to hell with them, I'm off for Texas. And so they rode in the quest for adventure. Rode on into the Alamo. Colonel Crockett, famed. Travis met him hat in hand. We are honored. Please assume command immediately. No, sir. Colonel Travis, Houston's put you in charge, I understand. I just want to be a private, but I do have one request. Let my boys and me man the most dangerous part of the ramparts. And so they gathered. Disappointing news coming in that there would be no more volunteers. And then Santa Ana arrived, first with 1,000 men, and then with 4,000 men. And on a blustery February day, he rode out to the little fort, read the proclamation, lay down your arms and surrender. You will be granted an amnesty. If you do not, everyone will be put to the sword. There was a great cannon there. The men at the Alamo had a number of cannons and Travis just walked up to it, puffed his cigar for a second, lit the fuse. And off went the cannon shot into the midst of Santa Ana's army. Well, Jim Bowie was another frontiersman there. He said, you know, I don't like Travis, 
but he sure as hell knows the best way to start a war. Jim Bowie, born in Louisiana, we can visit his boyhood home. Famed for his knife, ran for a while with John Lafitte, the pirates, killed Lafitte's son in a knife fight. But even Lafitte was afraid to take him on. But made his way out to Texas, married well, and then the plague took his wife and children. So he too, a man of destiny, like Davy Crockett, like Travis, had come to the Alamo. In fact, all of these heroes were men of destiny. And then the Sp Mexicans began to beat out a somber tune on their drums, one that went all the way back to the wars between the Spanish and the Moors of the Middle Ages. No quarter shall be given. And thus began the bombardment of the Alamo. After 24 hours, Travis sent out a message to Americans and lovers of liberty all over the world. We have been under bombardment for 24 hours. We have not lost a single man. We intend to do everything that honor requires. Death or victory, God and Texas. Take good care of my little boy. Isn't that touching? And so the bombardment went on day after day. The fort had becoming ever weaker, casualties inflicted. Finally, in the early morning of March the 6th, the Mexican army moved forward quietly, carrying with them scaling ladders. And as the dawn broke, they rushed the fort. First they got over the walls. Hand-to-hand -hand combat ensued. In the midst of it, Travis was shot dead in the head. But still, the Americans held on. Those killer blue eyes. The Mexicans had never seen anything like it how fast they could load, shoot, load, shoot, load, shoot, how accurate they were. But one by one they fell. Bowie was ill with influenza. They broke into the little hospital where he was. His faithful slave threw his body over Bowie. But they bayoneted the slave and bayoneted Bowie. And there towards the last was Davy Crockett. Oh, I know you're going to correct me and tell me all these stories about how Davy really died. He surrendered. Oh, what a blemish and a shame. He never surrendered. He went down fighting, clubbing Mexicans. Why, there is the story that a gentleman from Arkansas sent to Mrs. Crockett a package and inside of it was the gold watch of Davy that she had given him. And the gentleman from Arkansas said he bought it from a Mexican soldier who said he took it off of a dead gringo, a big gringo, who lay surrounded by the bodies of many a dead Mexican. The Alamo had fallen, but Houston was beginning to build his army. Santa Ana now began to sweep across eastern Texas, burning and pillaging as he went, driving trains of refugees, of women and children. And Houston kept retreating and retreating and retreating. That's not why we joined up, Houston, his men said. We joined up to fight them. They have burned our town. They're burning our farms. We're not ready to fight them yet, boys. And so on and on they retreated, Santa Ana becoming ever more confident dividing his forces into three columns, so he had barely a thousand men with him, about the size that Houston had with him. Then finally, on April the 20th, Houston's army reached about as far as they could go, the River San Jacinto, near Houston today, with a river and bayou cutting them off, Santa Ana's army pushing them hard, 
Houston's army was on the verge of dissolution. But they spent the night, and then the next morning, Houston got them up and said, boys, we, we can't find them today. If we don't fight them today, we're leaving. I'm telling you, we don't have the chance to fight them today. He knew how to get up their fighting spirit. Santa Ana was now so confident that when the noon siesta came, he told his men to take a rest, and he lay down to rest. And then the Texans began to move. Cavalry on their flanks, led by fire breathers from Georgia, Tennessee, Kentucky, the New Orleans Grays who had come all that way to fight for freedom. Two cannons pushed by the men sent by the city of Cincinnati as a tribute to the struggle for independence. And with a cry ringing out, remember the Alamo, they fell upon the Mexicans. The Mexicans staggered out of their siesta some of them tried to fight bravely, but again, we shot them down like dogs. These killer blue eyes, driving them into ravines and creeks, shooting them as they struggled there in the water, helpless, until the victory was total. Santa Ana had tried to disappear. He was with a group of prisoners, Try, had a dirty poncho on himself. But sharp-eyed frontiersmen saw that he had highly polished boots. And when the regular soldiers went by, they kept bowing to him. He'd wave like this, don't bow to me. They kept bowing to him. So they had him. And they took him over to Houston. Houston had been wounded by a bullet in the ankle. But there he told Santa Ana, you've got two choices. I shoot you, or you sign this treaty recognizing the independence of Texas. And so it was done. And the phrase, remember the Alamo and the freedom of Texas, would pass forever into the dictionary of freedom. The Story of Freedom in America with Dr. J. Rufus Fears is made possible by the generous support of our freedom and heritage sponsors. The Story of Freedom in America is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma in partnership with the Alumni Association of the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.